a mile, and we're sending a message. <laughs> the Second Baptist Church for the invocation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we thank you for these who have assembled here this afternoon, and we pray a special blessing upon each and every one of them, that you will protect them, God, and uh, that you will continue to lead them and guide them in ways that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, today we pray for our elected officials. We pray, God, that they realize that they are there by divine appointment and that they have a duty to govern in a way that is respectful and that builds up and that does not tear down. Lord, we're just thankful that you've given us this opportunity. We pray that you will order our steps this afternoon, that everything that we do and everything that we say, through it we will show the love of Jesus Christ and even though we disagree with their policies, Lord, that maybe by our example they will see that there is a better way to govern that indeed builds up and does not tear down. Amen. Thank you, God, again for this opportunity. Thank you for these who have assembled. We pray your blessing on this event. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to introduce Steve Loomis, who's yeah. the president of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Woo! I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And for the national anthem, Stephanie Nicholson. Oh, say can you Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watch, we're so gallantly streaming. Kendall, State Senator from the 23rd District. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. About 12 days ago, I had the honor of voting no on Senate Bill. This bill is designed to break the backs of working families in this state. That's all this bill does. Now, today, I'm honored to be here. 
I actually was born just down the street here in Medina Hospital in 1962. Went to school at Brunswick High School. The story before collective bargaining. The late 1970s, I was a student at Brunswick High School and the teacher struck over benefit and wages and working conditions. And what did they do to those teachers? If you recall, they put them in the pen right behind the uh, courthouse here, back in the late 70s. Who remembers that? You know what? Since collective bargaining passed in the early 1980s, we haven't had that problem because the differences have been resolved at the bargaining table. There have not been the strikes that we saw prior to collective bargaining. Why do we want to go back? Why do we want to return to that labor unrest? We should say no, and we should tell Speaker Batchelder from Medina County here, kill the bill! 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 Ladies and gentlemen, two facts that I want to give you. They say that this is important to balance the state budget. That is wrong. The collective bargaining units in 2008 to balance that state budget bargained collectively and made $250 million in concession through wage freezes, through additional uh, contributions to health care, and to unpaid furlough days. They saved the state $250 million. John Kasich, go back to the bargaining table. Our union members are willing to help balance the state budget. They've proven that. Number two, we see a lot of teachers out here. Do you know that they say that our, it's you that is breaking the backs of uh, Ohioans, of taxpayers, and you're getting paid too much? Do you know? Now let's set the, let's set the facts straight, ladies and gentlemen, that from 2008 to 2009, teachers in the state of Ohio took an average pay decrease of 3.8%. Cut in salaries, and that's just salaries. Teachers, you have worked hard. You, we put our students in the, your hands for education. We appreciate your service. Thank you, everybody. Our, we have State Representative Mike Foley. Thank you, and I want to thank everyone for coming out today on a cold day in Medina, Ohio. My name is Mike Foley. I'm a state representative from the west side of Cleveland. And I just want to tell you one thing. You want to, you want to know, I think, one of the things you want to know is where are we on Senate Bill 5, right? Yeah. I want you to know I'm a no on Senate Bill 5. And I know all my friends are here for you to no know on Senate Bill 5. Look, we are in the midst of a, a, a crisis in America right now. What's going on in Wisconsin, what's going on in Indiana, what's going on in New Jersey, it's happening here in Ohio as well. We all know that. And that's why people are out here today. We've got the greatest gap between rich and poor in this country since before the Great Depression. The top 1% of income earners in this country are only about as much as 90% of the bottom of the income earners in this country. That is wrong, and that, but that's what this that's what this Republican Party, that's what this Republican Party nationally is trying to institute in, in, in America and in Ohio with John Kasich, and John Kasich and Bill Batchelder are trying to place on us with bills like Senate Bill 5. Senate Bill 5 is an attack on the middle class. It's an attack on working people in this state. And I'm not going to put up with it. I know you're not going to put up with it. Which is why it's so important that people are out today and that you're coming down to Columbus and you're yelling and ranting and raving. And we've got to take this moment. Um, I've got my, uh, my uh, chairman up in Cuyahoga County calls this a lemonade moment, right? We need to make lemonade out of what is an awful lemon that's being thrown at us right now. Turn this around and turn back Ohio so that in two years from now, at a year and a half from now, we're not in the same situation where we've got Republicans running the state of Ohio and, and, and beating us down and beating us back and, and killing the middle class in Ohio. 
The middle class are the folks who go to the bakery shop across the street. They're the folks that go to the Grand Market Grill. They're the folks that buy uh, ice cream from uh, Lyles across the street. That's where we, that's where we, that's what the middle class does, and that's what's going to be destroying small businesses across the state if they get their way by, by passing Senate Bill 5. So I want to thank everyone for coming out here today and help us as we're, we're fighting this over the next couple weeks in Columbus. Thank you very much. State Representative Kenny uh, Yuko, who is the ranking member on the, uh, the Commerce and Labor Committee, which is having hearings on this bill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Come on, I am a state representative, but I'm a union member first. Yeah. Yeah. Negotiator representing public employees throughout Northeast Ohio. Now, I may not know a lot about everything, but one thing I know about is public employee collective bargaining. I was around in 1980 through 1983 when we put together Senate Bill 133. I stood with Senator Gene Branstill at a press conference in 1983 when he announced to the people of Ohio, collective bargaining works, it's good for the workers, it's good for the cities, it's good for Ohio. Two weeks ago, I had the honor of having another press conference with Senator Branstill, and the message was the same. Collective bargaining does work. Now we have a governor who thinks he can break organized labor by taking away collective bargaining. It's not going to happen. And I'll tell you what, he's not going to break labor, but he will break Ohio. And that we can't let him do. You know what? We, we represent the police. We represent the fire, the teachers, the social workers, the prison guards, the nurses, the bus drivers, everybody who takes care of from our very young to our very old. Okay? And I got news for this governor. We're not going away. We will not be silenced. And we will not be defeated. Stick together, my union brothers and sisters. Continue to fight. We will continue to fight. Next, I'd like to introduce Pam Miller, who's the chair of the Medina Democratic Party. Yeah! Thank you, Jay. And I want to thank Jay and the Brunswick Democratic Club and all and Joe Lewandowski, all the people who pulled the, this event together so on such a short notice. We Democrats have always been on the side of our friends in organized labor, and we are here with you today. For too long now, the Republicans have been playing a divide and conquer game, distracting you with single-minded social issues and people in funny hats. But now we see what they're really up to, turning our communities against the people who teach our children, against the people who control our streets, and the people who take care of our infrastructure. We, this is not a battle about budgets. This is a battle about destroying the middle class. Governor Kasich, the Koch brothers, Spiegel Bradchilder are all about destroying the middle class, destroying our democracy as we know it today. And something else, you look around, the public sector unions are predominantly women, and this is an attack on women. Let me tell you, the next thing these people have on their agenda is to take away voting rights. They want to make it harder for poor people and minorities and young people to vote. We must stop them now. And so let's all come together today and forge a, a feeling of coming together to save Ohio, to save America. Thank you. If there's anyone on the front line protecting workers, it is Congresswoman Betty Sutton. Thank you. It's so good to see you out here standing shoulder to shoulder fighting for the middle class and workers in this state. I'm so glad to be here with you. You know, uh, before I was in Congress, before I had the honor to serve there, I had the privilege to represent 
some of our public employees, the teachers. Let's hear it for the teachers. What is at stake is not just public sector employees, it's workers across this country. There is a state-by-state -state attack going on in this nation from Wisconsin to Ohio to the halls of Congress and we must stand against it. Are you ready to fight this Woo! fight? just like those who have chosen to keep our community safe and to keep us healthy and well. And let's be clear, as I said, this isn't just about our public sector workers. This is also about our private sector workers. Because if, if we are together, solidarity workers. And we must be together because let me share with you what's going on in Congress at the same time see what's emboldened in Wisconsin and in Ohio and in Michigan and Indiana. In Congress, they are coming after the trades. Are there any people here from the trades? The people who built this country? Teamsters! Teamsters too! Just a couple of weeks ago, right on the House floor, we saw an attack on prevailing wage. When did it become a problem in this country? The problem in this country that people are being paid a wage that they can raise their family on. That is not the problem with this country. That is the solution for this country. We need more jobs. We need more jobs that will pay the revenue that will help us fund the public sector workers. Is there anyone out there who would like our government to focus on jobs? And we saw what happened in Wisconsin under the cover of darkness. Yeah. In one fell swoop, they illegitimately cast democracy aside. They cast aside to silence, to silence the voices of their workers, to take away rights that they had had for 50 years. We ain't taking it anymore. occur. The same corrupt kind of practice where when they knew they didn't have the votes in committee, yeah. they just yeah. removed the person yeah. who would yeah. stop yeah. this passage? Yeah. Is that legitimate? No. And what happened then? Not only did they do it once, they did it twice. Yeah. That, too. that is not how we do things in Ohio and we are going to require So now we're headed to the House, and we're here today, right here in Speaker Batchelder's backyard, to urge him to stop this attack on workers and focus on creating jobs. Yeah. So we have to let them know. We have to let them know because we know that they've got votes in the House of Representatives. We know might be longer than the passage of this bill. And the question that we all have to ask ourselves today and tomorrow and next week and next month and throughout the years and days ahead is are we in this for the long haul? Are you here to send the message that no matter what happens, we will not quit. We Unions 
make no mistake about it, help to deliver to this country a middle class. And it is that middle class that makes this country strong. This is not just an attack on unions. It's not just an attack on, middle, on, on workers. This is an attack on the strength and the fiber of our nation. We see in Michigan seniors being asked to give more so that more tax cuts to businesses can be given. We all understand that we're in this together. And we all understand and are willing to share our, our and sacrifice accordingly. But we have to say enough is enough. Stop pointing the finger at workers. Workers didn't drive our economy off the cliff. Wall Street drove our economy off the cliff. Let's introduce Mike Todd, Medina Township Trustee. All right, well, it's hard to follow up Congresswoman Sutton. <laughs> But I'll tell you, I, I've been blessed, and the reason I can tell you I've been blessed is in my life when I was a teenager, I had two great grandparents who were born in the 1800s. And why is that important? My family grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, they worked in coal mines, and they fought the fights on the front line against the private security firms that came in and kept them from working in the coal mines. That is something that they have passed on to me my entire life. My grandfather, when he came back from World War II, what's the importance? He will tell you that without the Teamsters, he would never have been able to find a job to continue to work because he had a fifth grade education. Fifth grade. And without the Teamsters, he would not have been able to make a living wage to take care of me, my sister, my father, my aunt, my grandmother. It was the unions that made it so that I could be here today on this step. It was the unions that helped pay the bills to put food in my mouth, and you can see I've eaten enough of it. All right? But it was the unions that did that. Okay? And I think that our generation, my generation, they don't they weren't there with those fights. They weren't here when they were talking about labor organization in the 70s and 80s because we were young. We have forgotten what the roots are. And it's time for us, my generations, professionals, workers, everybody to get together behind those that work and are the backbone of our country to ensure that we get better. I tell you, I'm here on behalf of many good young Democrats who work in this county. I know that Nick Hannock is out there, Jay Smith, Dan Coleman, Andrew Burdell Ware, all of us are the next generation. We are going to take that torch, we're going to move forward and fight the fight. There's a couple other things I want to add, and I, I put some notes together because I thought it was important. Dave Lanera from Montville Township sent a letter to the editor, and he said, he was tired of hearing selfish and arrogant attitudes they expressed, meaning the unions. Never is there any thanks for the millions of tax dollars that give, have given them the best salaries and benefits in the state while working in non-productive businesses. All right? That was his statement. Dave Lanera. You want to know what's even more of a hypocrisy here? Guess what Dave Lanera does for a living? He restores historical guns. Tell me how that's productive to society. I'm serious. Tell me one way that that's productive. Now let's go one step further. That statement 
is so insulting on so many levels. Deputy Suzanne Hopper down in Clark County out doing her job in the middle of the day and guess what happens? She got shot. She got shot and killed. That's somebody who's not productive. She's out there making sure you live in a safe community where you can live in that $400,000 big mansion you have and you want to say she's not productive. That's an insult. In our township, Matt Ventura, officer, he got an award two years ago for helping pull a car back from a fire. The fire's right there. Could have died in that fire. He helped the lady who was trapped in her vehicle so she did not perish. That's not productive. You want to talk about selfish and no thanks? Do you think Dave Lanera called Matt Ventura and said thank you? I don't think so. Josh McTarian, middle of the night, Twinsburg Township, police officer, pulls somebody over, gets murdered in cold blood. Do you think he was thanked? Do you think anybody said, because you're non-productive, Officer McCarrion, we don't believe that you're doing a good job. He's productive because he makes sure that the community's safe that we work in. He makes sure that the wages that we have can be spent on the things that we want, like American cars. And then the last thing I really want to talk about is Senator LaRose and Senator Ohoff were in. Let me tell you what's real insulting. One timers, one they come timers. here in the Medina Township, in the my township that I represent, at the Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, never told me they were coming, didn't invite me, didn't say come and tell us what you think, because they say that this bill helps local governments balance their budget, right? So don't you think I'm a stakeholder since I control the local gov government's budget? But they don't call me and ask my opinion. They don't want to know. They don't want to know. And then they had the temerity to say, and LaRose said this specifically, that collective bargaining is a fundamental right. That's what he said. And what's he go do? He votes for Senate Bill 5. I know I'm getting a little long-winded, but it really gets me fired up, is uh, the Governor Kasich. Come on, you can boo again. He keeps saying, he keeps saying that there was a mandate at the polls last November. Okay? That's what he keeps saying. If there was a mandate, the mandate was for politics in general. It was not about unions. It was because they're tired politicians that will stand here and not stand for anything. They're tired of those Senator LaRosas and Opals that'll tell you they love you and then stab you in the back when it's time for a vote. That's what the people wanted. That's what the people spoke on. They didn't speak on Republicans or Democrats. It's time now that we say what they really wanted to know is for us to believe in taking care of the middle class. That's what they voted on. We need to make sure that next year, this year, it doesn't stop. We don't forget. People's memories are short. I can ask you, and I ask every township employee, township trustee that's out there, to pass a resolution against Senate Bill 5 to say that we, as local politicians, will not stand for it. We don't believe in it. We believe more in our employees. We believe in the teachers that educate our children. We believe in the firefighters that go into those burning buildings. And as Congresswoman Sutton eloquently explained, this is not the end. Don't think that this is the last bill that we're going to see. There's going to be a more of a fight ahead. And we can't stop now, we can't stop next year, and we need to continue on. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I appreciate it. So I've heard some from several elected officials, but we want to hear from some of our religious leaders on why they are standing on our side. So I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Coolidge from the American Friends Society.
I'm with an organization called the American Friends Service Committee. It's a Quaker-related organization that believes in the dignity and worth of every person. Now, how's that for a radical concept? That every single person should have equal rights. That every single person, regardless of political affiliation, of race, of gender, of economic worth, should be able to have their voice heard, their needs met, their communities helped. Now I've heard a slogan that I think is quite relevant in this context. It goes, United we bargain, divided we beg. United we bargain, divided we beg. United we bargain, divided we beg. That sense of unity, that sense of solidarity, that sense of kinship is so important today because the fight that we are up against is indeed profound. And it is certainly one that we must have our enlightened prophetic of public officials on our side, be they federal, state, and local, if we've heard. Let's give them a hand. But we also need us. We also need you and those who are standing next to you and behind you because the fight to the struggle has to be won where we come together in solidarity. Now, we hear that this struggle is about money. Money is certainly an issue. We have an $8 billion state debt, a $14 trillion federal budget deficit. Those are real. Those aren't magically made up. Those are legitimate. We must deal with them. But we should not deal with those issues and solve these issues, so to speak, and try to balance the budget on the back of the middle class, the poor, the seniors, the students, the teachers, the firefighters, the police officers, and all the rest. And what we have is a massive distraction and excuse going on. The excuse is that we have this budget problem and therefore we can't solve it in any other way. That's a lie. That's a lie. And it's a diversion away. A diversion. All this time immemorial to get you to look one place so that mischief making can go on somewhere else. And where is that mischief making? Several sources. One, the incredible amount of give backs that are going on right now in the name of, at least wanted, in the name of privatization slash corporatization that the governor and his minions want to do on everything that is not locked down. From, you name it, lotteries, to the Ohio Department of Development, to you name it, turnpikes and everything else. That's one diversion going on, that they want to give away the store in the name of balancing the budget. Second diversion going on, we have seen massive amounts of givebacks and of tax breaks to the well-to-do. Where's the sign? U.S. CEOs right here make this incredible amount of money. The top 1% of people in this country, the wealthiest, not just the rich, not just the super rich, the super duper rich. That's right, the super duper rich, the top 1% of their wealth. They control 43% of this nation's wealth. Top 1%. Yet, we have state leaders, quote unquote leaders, federal leaders, quote unquote leaders, that want to extend the tax breaks to those well-to-do people. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to balance the budget? Exhibit A, raise the taxes on the super duper rich. And the last thing, the distraction, the distortion, is not just simply about money. Where's the sign back here about democracy, 
Democracy may have gone somewhere else. Democracy is deep in Ohio. This is not just simply an issue about money. No, my friends, it's about democracy. It's about collective rights. It's about your power to decide. It's about our power to make decisions that affect our lives, our communities, our brothers and sisters. What we saw, you want proof positive of that? Look at Wisconsin. When the Democrats are out of state, they passed that law. You know what they did? They cut it in half. They dealt just with the collective bargaining powers. Powers. It didn't have anything to do with money. It was all about power. It was all about rights. It was all about democracy. That's what it's all about. And the last thing, they're also going after, again, our diversion, our attraction somewhere else. As the sister here from the Democratic Party, Medina, quite correctly said, they're going not just for collective bargaining, they're going for the basic heart and soul of self-governance itself, including right to make decisions and voting rights. My friends, that's what they did in Wisconsin. When the Democrats were out of state, the Republicans voted to make it more difficult for people to vote. Distractions and distortions. We have to stop it, and the only way to do that is to come together, to stay together, to be together, and we can do it together with our friends inside, but with us on the outside. Let's bring democracy from Cairo to Columbus. From Cairo to Columbus. Thank you. We got him, Betty. We will. We're going to get him. Uh, next, we're going to have Reverend Carter uh, again. Good afternoon. I'm Cornell Carter. I'm the pastor of Second Baptist Church here in Medina. And I've been following Senate Bill 5 for some time. And I can say to you today that it is more than political. I believe it is downright sinister. I believe it's downright sinful, the gluttony and the greed that our state leaders have introduced into the budget process. And I dare say that we don't want to become a state known for gluttony. We don't want to become a state known for greed. We've got to send the message to Columbus that we want to be known as fair, hardworking, honest people who deserve a level and a fair playing field. that we're not going to allow Ohio to become the 21st century Sodom and Gomorrah. It stops today. It stops today. Now I have to leave, but I want to say one more thing before I go. We've got to send this message, and we've got to send it loud and clear. Now I want you to say with me, and let's say it so that Speaker Batchelder can hear us as he sits on the veranda of his home not too far from where we are today. Let's say, not Ohio! Not Ohio! Not now! Not now! Not ever! Not ever! Not Ohio! Not Ohio! Not now! Not now! Not ever! Not ever! Not ever. God bless you! I think he heard us that time. We have Reverend Dream Krause. Uh, how many of you are people of faith? Oh, I didn't think people of faith thought like this. You see, for me, this is about the soul of America. And it is a time that you and I stood up in our own faith communities and we said there is another way to understand this thing we call faith and we've got to be more public about it. You see, 
The God that I preach about, the God that I teach about, is the God who said that when you get to the promised land, that's when everybody who works will earn the benefit of their own labor. Their labor will come to them. It won't go off to some fat cats. All right? That's the God I worship. The God I worship says, you know what I really want of you? I want you to do justice. Do justice. Do justice. I want you to walk kindly with one another. And I want you to walk humbly with God. Justice, kindness, humility. Those are matters that make our country what it is. My country is one that is concerned about the middle class. It is a country that is concerned about the lower classes. And it is a country that understands that when you have much, much is required of you. My God needs every person here. Because, you see, it's when you speak and when I speak that God's presence is known. So we need to make God's presence known in Columbus and in Washington and in every place else. God bless you all. Okay, um... Next, we have the Minority Leader of the House of Representatives here with us, um, Armin Budish. Hello, everybody. One more step down. All right. Thanks for letting us stay. All right. We got our work cut out for us. This is an attack on the middle class. This is a, an attack on all workers. I don't care if you're union or not union. This is an attack on all working people. You know, right now we have Senate Bill 5. Senate Bill 5, they say, does not eliminate collective bargaining. They say that it preserves collective bargaining, but let's look at what this law does. How many of you are teachers? Yeah. Republicans are saying this law preserves collective bargaining for teachers. This law allows you to bargain. This law allows you to negotiate. But if you don't agree with what they're offering you, you've got no recourse. You can't strike. You can't do anything. If you strike, you go to jail. That's collective bargaining? <laughs> How many of you work for the police or the firefighters? They say that this preserves collective bargaining for you. Let me just give you one example. If you want to negotiate over better safety equipment, better safe conditions, forget it. That's taken out by Senate Bill 5. That's not collective bargaining. This bill is just the beginning. Let me tell you, if you work for the trades, anybody here a carpenter, plumber, any other building trades? you next. Prevailing wage? Forget about it. Project labor agreements? There's already legislation in the House to eliminate project labor agreements. They've already done it with respect to school buildings last week. They are coming after you next. That's it. And let me, let me just tell you, if you work for a living in the private sector, anybody here a private sector worker? Yeah. Not union? Yeah. They're coming after you next. Right. We already have legislation in the House that's moving right now that eliminates overtime pay, time and a half. 
Gone! That's what's coming. This is an attack on the middle class across the board. People ask, what are we going to do? I'm the minority leader in the House. I'm the Democratic leader in the House. We have 40 out of 99. We had 53 before the last election. I was the speaker before the last election. Well, I can tell you what we didn't do in the House last time. We didn't put Senate Bill 5 on. We didn't attack labor. We didn't put... We didn't, I, I can't tell you all the things they're doing right now. It's scary. It's scary. It is scary. So people ask, what are we going to do with 40 votes? What are we going to do? And I've told them we can only do one thing. We can do what you're all doing today. We're going to fight like hell against the Republicans. We're going to fight like hell to keep that bill from coming out of committee. If we lose there, we're going to fight like hell on the floor of the House. And if we lose there, we're going to the ballot in November. Want to change the camera? To change the battery type? Uh, thank you. Okay. It's fine. So we need to stop this bill. We cannot destroy our unions. And I'd like to introduce Dan Coleman, who is a member of the OCSEA union, who works for the Ohio State Patrol as a driver's license examiner. Bill, folks. Give me the Kill the bill. 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 It's a nasty bill, isn't it? Yeah. Have you read it yet? Yeah. We're all here in it, and we're all in it together. Now, I want to call out, and I want to thank Jay Smith, the key organizer behind this event. Yay! Yay! Thank you, Jay. I also want to say thanks to all the unions out there. I know we got the FOP. Woo! I saw some firefighters out there. Thank you. I saw some Teamsters. Yeah! I saw the UAW. Yeah! We're all in this together, guys. I saw Ask Me, didn't I? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Who did I miss? The teachers. Yeah. Now, let me tell you a story about teachers who I remember to this very day who stood beside me when I was a weird little kid in, in high school. And they said, you're going to go somewhere someday, Dan. I said, how do you know that? I'm going nowhere. You know, I had my college dreams. I went to great Ohio colleges, and I got my degrees. But you know what? They believed in me every step of the way. They raised me, they taught me, and they gave me hope for the future. And then we want to slash these folks' benefits? They get nothing as it is. Wait till they retire and they can barely cover their medicine every day, every month that they need. Because it's not good enough as it is. But yet, we're going to attack them. Where is the pay cut for John Kasich? Where is it? Where is it? You know how much he makes? $141,000 and some change. What's that? And he wants to attack my pay? You can go online and see it right now. It's 34 grand a year. How is that fair? I want to see him get in the car with a bad driver. When they pull out in front of the semi. That's right. They'll probably, they'll probably do something bad like soil his pants. But we won't go there, folks. So we got to fight together. We gotta fight together and we can't let them do this to us. I want to know that you'll be with me when we are gonna go door to door to get the signatures to get this on the ballot. Let's just kill this bill! There sure are a lot of teachers here today. My mom was a teacher, 29 years. Go, Jackie Smith! 
president of the teachers union. My dad was with the UAW at the Chrysler plant up in Twinsburg. So, you know, this bill, it's just, we, we need to kill it. And we will need your help when we go to referendum. So if you have not yet, please sign up on one of our forums. We have several people with clipboards. We have a table over on the side. We will need your help, whether you live here or in, or in another county. These lists and information are going to be shared, so please sign up. Um, next, I want to introduce Steve Loomis from the president, uh, the president of the Cleveland Policemen's Association. Yeah. Thank you. I want to start off by introducing Terry Gallagher. Uh, he's also uh, the president of the OPBA Yay! here in Ohio. They represent about 8,000 or so uh, police officers across the state. We, uh, Thank you. This bill has absolutely galvanized the unions across this state. Galvanized them. We've been asleep at the switch, folks. Every single one of us has been asleep at the switch. My guys are the worst when it comes to getting involved in these politics, and I've never seen them uh, uh, react the way that they've been reacting right now. Uh, we formed a coalition down in Columbus. It, there's nine union people, presidents, uh, firemen, and cops sitting at the same table. Where's my firemen buddies? They're like our brothers. We get to fight with them, but nobody else can. And uh, 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 we have 40,000 people that we represent down there. And the only reason that we've been able to get into the doors down there and talk to these senators and talk to these assemblymen is because of you folks out here. The huge rallies down there, 20,000 people. I mean, it's incredible. It's electric. And uh, I think that this is going to blow up in Governor Kasich's face. Now, let me tell you something. I'm not a politician. I am not a lobbyist. I am a street cop from the city of Cleveland. And the crap that I've learned since I've been walking around down here three days a week for the last five weeks is incredible, it's insulting, and it's grotesque. The fact that they could pull uh, Senator Seitz off that committee yeah. is absolutely grotesque and it should be illegal. Uh, this is what their game is going to be, okay? For those of us that are represented by Republican assemblymen, Batchelder is going to give a certain number of those guys a pass. This is politics, partisan politics 101, okay? And I learned it on the fast track down there. He's going to give six or seven of them a pass. He's going to make it seem like we're making some headway down there, and we are, and we're going to continue to keep that pressure up. But he'll give six or seven of those Republican uh, uh, assemblymen a pass, just like he gave uh, uh, Gilmore a pass. Or not Gilmore, Gail Manning. Gail Manning, I'm sorry. Uh, LaRose, they beat, that, they beat that kid up like you wouldn't believe. He got calls from the Republican National Party leadership saying, hey, get on board. This guy's 29 years old, just came from the Gulf War. I like him. I met him. I met him personally, and I like what he stood for, but he was a 29-year-old kid that could not stand up to the politics in the state. Just say no. Just say no. His flags were planted. His flags were planted until 45 minutes before that election, or that, that, that vote. And then he flipped on us. Um, that is, he ain't seen nothing yet. That's right. He hasn't seen nothing yet. And, and he, he is going to pay the piper for that. They're worried about losing the the, uh, uh, the Republican stronghold that they have in the House. Do not, if, if, if you know or trust in anything that I tell you right now, do not believe for one second that there's a Republican Assemblyman that is voting no on this thing because they believe it's the right thing to do. They're voting no on it, if, if there is six or seven of them right now, because they're given a pass because they don't want us out in their front yards beating them up next time at the polls. And we can't let that happen. We have to make sure. We'll flip this back to the back to the Democrats the way it needs to be so there's some checks and balances in this state. Um, I, I'm listening to Governor Kasich. I got to testify at the committee hearing the other day. Governor Kasich is on CNBC saying no arbitrator from Iowa is going to come in here and tell my city managers what to pay their employees. 
I testified, folks, there's only one or two possibilities. Either A, our governor is lying to the national public, Imagine. national public, or B, he is completely disenfranchised and misinformed as to what the hell is in this thing. He's lying right? in his he has no clue what's going on. Those are the only two possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. This bill is absolutely atrocious. We have nine attorneys working for us, for our coalition. And they, you have to see them sitting at the table. They're arguing amongst themselves as the ramifications of this thing. It's so complicated and it's so complex. And Shannon Jones introduced it to her committee with nobody else seeing this thing. Who's Shannon Jones? And watch for her name to come up. She's going to be running for something here soon with the back in the Republican Party, I guarantee it. All right? She wants transparency, yet she introduces this thing and gives the, the members of her own committee the copy of it 15 minutes after her introduction. There's no transparency there. They wanted to vote that out of the Senate in three days. And because of this and because of the rallies, they were not able to do that, although they're going to vote it out. You know, same with the House. The Speaker badge holder is having more hearings, and whoever wants to speak is going to be able to speak. But at the end of the day, folks, that's going to get voted out of House, out of committee and out of the House. There's no way that we're going to have the votes to stop it. We have to concentrate on the referendum. That is the only way, and we're going to speak. And let me tell you something else, too. There's a lot of uh, uh, very cool ideas about getting a second ballot issue uh, form formulated, and, and, and I don't know what the details of that are now, but as long as we're going out and getting signatures, we might as well get some signatures to make this better for us and people in this state and the middle class in this state. So thank you for your time. You. Hey, oh, I want to tell, some, tell you something. This pen I got from my 12-year-old kid, his teacher is passing out of school. Fantastic down in Columbus. They actually scared the hell out of me a little bit because they, they, they come up, they come up to us, and they think that the safety forces are trying to somehow get cut out of this bill. And I can tell you, I am a member of the, this coalition, and I can tell you with a straight face that we are not lobbying to get cut out of this bill. We are not talking to them about getting cut out of this bill because guess what? If we get cut out of this bill. They get you guys today, they're coming after us tomorrow. We have to stick together on this. That public sector, private sector, this is going to backfire in his face. The unions are galvanized. We, we have strange bedfellows. My, my buddies in the fire department and I, are, we're all working together. United we stand. United we stand. God bless you. United we stand. to introduce Michael Patterson from Dennis Kucinich's office. Well, Dennis would have loved to have been here with you today. Unfortunately, he couldn't, so he called me up at 6 in the morning and said, get over here, and so I did. And I'm very glad because he's going to be very happy to hear that so many of you turned up for this today. And from what I've heard, I think he would agree with all that's been said. So you people, keep on fighting, and we'll keep on fighting. Hey! Someone's not going to be able to leave. We have keys. Are they yours? Next, I'd like to introduce Jack Shiro. Hi, my name is Jack Shiro. Some of you know me as the guy that ran against Bill Batchelor. Got his butt kicked. But uh, my love for everybody that's here comes directly from being a kid. My dad, 
was in the steel mills before they were organized. He knows the importance of collective bargaining. He felt it saved his life. The mills were a dangerous place to work in. You folks here fighting for collective bargaining, for our public employees, fighting for the killing of this terrible, terrible bill are the salt of the earth. You're the folks that make America great, and God bless you. I'm with you 100%, as are most of the people out there, regardless of their political party. You are right in what you're demanding. You've got to have collective bargaining. The big guys on top will not take care of you. One of the things that uh, I've heard as far as an argument against our movement here is, oh gee, the unions aren't really needed anymore because you've got laws installed that protect you now, that take care of our safety, that take care of this. You've got all the big work done. We don't need organized labor anymore. That is so much bull. In fact, this is what is being done. Laws are being changed. They're trying to outlaw in the Senate bill the uh, public uh, agencies from even allowing collective bargaining. So thank you for all for being here. God bless you. I'm behind you. The people are behind you. Keep up the fight. Kill Senate Bill 5. And now from the Teamsters Local 407, Charles Andrew. Hello, Medina County, how you doing? Uh, everything uh, I was going to say today has already been said. Betty said it, uh, everybody. Uh, this is an attack on working class people. Can we take one step backwards? No. Are we going to let them ram this down our throats? Stay involved, get a petition when they come out, stay, stay informed, uh, an injury to one is an injury to all. Uh, Teamsters Local 407 is right with you, uh, Medina County, we'll be right here with you all the time. I think it's time that we hear from some teachers. So I'd like to introduce Joanne Shire. Hi, everybody! Okay, now, I, I, I did type this up large, but I still need my glasses. Okay. <laughs> I actually had to buy a new pair of boots after Canton's rally because my feet were frozen. Alright, All right, here's what I want to say. Collective bargaining works! It's much more than just wages and benefits. It's how we get things done. It's a system of checks and balances between labor and management. for our students and our community. Dr. Seuss had it right. In Horton Hears a Who, all those small voices in Whoville raised their voices and together they were finally heard.
city schools. And we came to the table, both sides, to get a fair contract. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne. Teachers are responsible citizens. We don't ask for anything outrageous because we too are voters and taxpayers. exact response back. I told him that I was one of his constituents here in Medina and that he needed to hear my voice. Whatever his agenda, he still needs to hear from all of us. And I urged him, vote no. this story. <laughs> you may have heard this story, most of the educators, and by the way, it's not just educators, it's our support staff. staff have heard the blueberry story, but I'm going to share this because there may be some of us who haven't heard this story. This is because of merit pay, which is something that they plan to institute with Senate Bill 5. I don't know how you can figure out how somebody's worth, I don't know. Anyway. A businessman learns a lesson by Jamie Robert Vollmer. If I ran my business the way you people operate your schools, I wouldn't be in business very long. I stood before an auditorium filled with outraged teachers who were becoming angrier by the minute. My speech had entirely consumed their precious 90 minutes of in-service. Their initial icy glares had turned to restless agitation. You could cut the hostility with a knife. I represented a group of business people dedicated to improving public schools. Yeah. I was an executive at an ice cream company that became famous in the middle 1980s when People Magazine chose our blueberry as the best ice cream in America. <laughs> I was convinced of two things. First, public schools needed to change. There were archaic selecting and sorting mechanisms designed for the industrial age and out of step with the needs of our emerging knowledge society. Second, educators were a major part of the problem. They resisted change, hunkered down in their feathered nest, protected by tenure and shielded by a bureaucratic monopoly. They needed to look at business. We knew how to produce quality, zero defects, TQM, continuous improvement. In retrospect, in retrospect the speech was perfectly balanced, equal parts, but as soon as I finished, excuse me, as soon as I finished, a woman's hand shot up. She appeared polite, pleasant. She was in fact a razor-edged veteran high school English teacher who had been waiting to unload. She began quietly. We are told, sir, that you manage a company that makes good ice cream. 
I smugly replied, best ice cream in America, ma'am. How nice, she said. Is it rich and smooth? 16% butter fat, I crowed. Premium ingredients, she inquired. Super premium, nothing but triple A. I was on a roll, I never saw the next line coming. <laughs> Mr. Vollmer, she said, leaning forward with a wicked eyebrow raised to the sky. When you are standing on your receiving dock and you see an inferior shipment of blueberries arrive, what do you do? In the silence of that room, I could hear the trap snap. <laughs> I was dead meat, but I wasn't going to lie. I send them back. Yeah. That's right, she barked. <laughs> and we can never send back our blueberries. Yeah. We take them big, small, rich, poor, gifted, exceptional, abused, frightened, confident, homeless, rude, and gray. Mr. Vollmer, is why it's not a business, it's a school! In an explosion of all night, 290 teachers, principals, bus drivers, aides, custodians, and secretaries, they jumped to their filled feet and yelled, Yay, blueberries! <laughs> began my long transformation. Since then, I have visited hundreds of schools. I have learned that schools are not a business. Schools are unable to control the quality of their raw material. They are dependent upon the vagaries of politics for a reliable revenue stream. And they are constantly mauled by a howling horde of disparate competing customer groups that would send the best CEO screaming into the night. None of this negates the need for change. We must change what, when, and how we teach children to give all a maximum opportunity to thrive. But educators cannot do this alone. These changes can occur only with the understanding trust, permission, and active support of the surrounding communities. For the most important thing I have learned is that schools reflect the attitudes, beliefs, and health of the communities they serve. And therefore, to improve public education means more than changing our schools. It means changing America. Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! So we take billions of taxpayers' dollars to bail out Wall Street CEOs. Kasich gives 40% pay raises to his administration. But we can't pay our teachers. We can't pay our firefighters. Who is sacrificing? We are. They are not. They need to. I want to uh, introduce Judy Cross, former Brunswick school teacher. Yeah, I no longer judge Judy. I retired. That's why I can talk. But I was a Brunswick school teacher, and I did sit in that courtroom over there on a day when many of my friends went to jail. 
I didn't. I was in my last year of law school and I quit because I knew if I didn't, I wouldn't be allowed to become a lawyer. It was illegal, Rich. We got somebody here. Where's this shirt? Come here. Come here. We survived the strike of 1978. We all had these shirts. They said, together we can, together we did. That's what you got to remember. You are educators, firemen, police officers, what you need, social workers, nurses. You are public servants. You are not public slaves. You gotta let them know that. And those of you that are private, you know they're coming after you too. All right. I'm old, I'm losing my short-term memory, but my long-term memory is there. You got it. Tax into, cut into your memory and keep us alive, not just till this November, but the next November. Yeah. This is not going to be a short-term fight, but it's a fight you got to fight. I didn't think we were going to have to do this again. I'm very sorry that we're doing it again, but we got to do it, and we got to stick together. Thank you. Yeah. And now I'd like to introduce Bill Lamb, who is a teacher and former uh, mayor of Medina. Well, you know, these things that we think are settled and over with just come back again and again. And every time they do, every time there's a breach in the wall, somebody has to be there to plug that breach. Somebody has to be there to stand up for what's right. Now, I'm not sure if the word is sad, disappointed, or maybe the word's insulted. But I know this. It's hard for me to imagine that you could grow up in this place, in this wealth, surrounded by the warmth of this community family. And then you could go to the State House and become the Speaker of the House and you could do what Bill Batchelder has done with this bill. That is wrong. Now we've heard a lot of great speakers and they've talked in detail about what's wrong with the bill. And so I'll tell you simply this. I am here because I'm a Democrat but not just because I'm a Democrat. I'm here because as a former mayor I supported unions, but not just because of that. I'm here because as a former teacher I belong to a teacher's union, but not just because of that. Not just because my father was a, was a union carpenter, but I am here simply because this is wrong. This is wrong. And here, where we've had so many events on this square, this is the one that really represents what's right about middle America. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Keith uh, Wolgamer. For, and he's a labor attorney with the police union. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, or is that union thugs and idiots? <laughs> I, 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 I am a labor attorney. I've been a labor attorney for about 30 years, both private and public sector. I am one of the nine coalition attorneys that Mr. Loomis mentioned. And he's right. We fight about this constantly. But the game seems to be who can find the worst provision. Because it goes on and on and on. After a month of studying the bill, plus the amendments, um, I, I'm still finding stuff yesterday that, that scares me to death. The point of that, in the end, is this can't be amended to be better. It can't be fixed. Now, I don't know what the House is going to do. I know there's amendments being folks. Don't buy it. It ain't going to work. 
A couple other quick points. One is, I, I, I think everybody here is more or less a true believer. I think that when it gets to referendum, I hope you will all be committed to gathering signatures, to getting the most Well, let's face it, there's a whole lot of public employees that aren't here. Now, some number of those folks couldn't be here, obviously. Some number, I guarantee you, aren't sure this is really going to have a big effect. So take this to them, okay? Now, this is a couple, but this is one in particular that isn't talked about a lot. Everybody has some form of just cause in their contracts for discipline or discharge? Pretty much, right? Well, in fact, the current act reserves to management the right to discipline or discharge for just cause. The act that's about to be passed takes that phrase out. For just cause disappears. Now, among us attorneys, we debate exactly what that's going to mean. For current contracts, probably not left, not much if you have four just cause in it. But I'm absolutely convinced that this group of labor attorneys, that this philosophy is aimed at getting rid of just cause. They want employment at will. Now, if that's not coming at the heart. I don't know what is. We can survive a lot of economics. We can't survive that. Okay, that's back to a manager saying to you, what'd you do for me yesterday? Otherwise, you're out. Okay? Um, my favorite that, that really just came to me yesterday, um, I, I think that, that they're, they're preparing a legal attack that will take away grievance arbitration completely over any issue, or particularly over um, discipline and discharge. And, and I'm serious. I mean, this is not just my nightmare. Um, I think it's actually in there. So again, got to get to everybody else who's not here. When the petition drives starts, it's got to be done fast and huge. This message has to be perfectly clear. Finally. I have lots of friends in my profession all across the country, and they routinely ask me, how's it going to go in Ohio? Because as we can see, it's dominoes, right? There's an agenda going on here across the country. And I routinely tell them, I think they made a mistake. I don't think they can pull this in Ohio. Ohioans don't put up with this crap. Okay? So we're going to show the rest of the nation how you take this kind of stuff down. And then we're going to remember, and it's going to be generational, and this is never going to happen again. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to let you guys know, if you have not gotten one of these yellow forms yet, you can get them at the table on the side. It has a list of um, Republican representatives that we need to call. It has their phone numbers and the address. So if you pick one up and call their offices and tell them what you think of this bill and send them cards, and then when you've gone through all of these people, give it to your friends and pass it around to all of them. Next. Um, Next, I want to introduce Danny Murphy from ODOT. Hello, everybody. I have a little thing I jotted down and I'd like to read to you. Uh, yes, I work at ODOT and I, uh, I brought part of my, my uniform with me here today. You've seen a lot of these. <laughs> Bear with me here. Really? My eyes are tearing up here. Um, yes, the folks at ODOT, uh, we're, we're in the business of saving lives, partly. I uh, live and work in Medina County and uh, work on the state highways throughout Medina County. Uh, there's snow and ice today. Myself and a lot of these others standing here wouldn't be here. We'd be out attending to the state highways. Uh, doing snow and ice and uh, pothole repair, 
We used to work 16 hour shifts at a time, being called at all hours of the day and night. Now we work 12 hour shifts so we can halfway have a life. This is due to union negotiations. For, for the past five years, our wages have been frozen and we have had no raises whatsoever. The last two years we've had uh, 10 cost saving days where that's where we get to sit at home and wonder how we'll pay the bills. Never in the last 14 years that I've been with ODOT have we had any form of uh, cost of living increase. Uh, as far as training, trade, ODOT's good in giving you training. I've taken over 55 various classes uh, having to do with various things like uh, asphalt compaction, concrete testing, the most recent class, uh, nuclear radiation compaction testing. Uh, started out as a highway technician one, worked up to an HT2, not currently an HT3. This past summer I had an opportunity to go out on uh, US Route 42 here between uh, Walmart and Sleepy Hollow Road as an ODOT inspector and helping the uh, ODOT engineer in uh, the resurfacing of uh, Route 42 with uh, placing of concrete curbing and uh, new catch basins. The ODOT folks are dedicated, especially when it comes to snow and ice removal. Don't, please don't make it more difficult on us by taking more money from us and uh, taking food out of our mouths and raising the cost of health insurance. Many of you do not know what it's like to be out in a bad storm in a dump truck with a snow plow. You're the only one out there to clear that road. And when cars go off the road, you uh, call the ODOT garage, and they call the state highway patrolman, another dedicated group of folks. We all have our teachers to thank for our upbringing, and uh, certainly firemen. Please vote no on this, this bill. And folks, when you see these uniforms and the Ohio State Highway Patrolmen slow down, please, and get off the cell phones. We're only out there to help you. Thank you for your time. I'd like to introduce Dave Kelly, um, who's a local businessman and uh, definitely helped put this rally together, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, first, I'd like to explain that I was a teacher for 19 years. All right. 12 years in Medina. I left education, contrary to what the governor says, to make more money for my family. The proudest years I had in my life were in a classroom, and they're the most important years any of you could ever spend influencing other people. I mean, this is what has made our society. They talk about what made America great, okay? It was not fighting for lower wages, okay? I've been to China for two and a half weeks, a couple weeks ago, and I saw what low wages do to a society. I also see a Germany with high wages that's doing incredibly well, a Sweden and other countries. This race to the bottom is the worst thing that could happen in our society. Remember how the United States emerged in the Gilded Age of robber barons. It was not because there were little pieces and crumbs that fell off of the carriages. It's because unions organized people through collective bargaining. That's what got a middle class and that's what created this society. And I hope we all stand together in these months to come. I'd like to also point out a couple statistics because I do a lot of research for Dennis Kucinich's campaigns. Just think about this. In America, as Michael Moore points out, a little bit more than the crowd here, about 400 people, have more wealth than the bottom 156 million Americans. 
That's mind-boggling. When they tell you there's not enough money, there is enough money for all of the things we need in our society. It's just that you can't pry it out of their cold, dead fingers. And I say cold, dead fingers because they will not even accept an estate tax for people who are very, very wealthy. They want people to be able to pass on $50 billion. $60 billion. And say society that the educational system, that the teachers and the people who built the roads, who plow the roads, who take care of, who set up our court system had nothing to do with it. They feel they owe nothing to our society. What could be less patriotic and less American than that attitude? We owe nothing to anyone else. Another statistic, the top 13,400 households in the United States earn more yearly income than the bottom 96 million Americans. There's something that's obscene about that as well. Last comment I'd like to make is, my daughter played soccer for Medina High. She then went to law school. I was very proud of her. She's one of those union thugs. One of those union bosses. She's doing something terrible in her life. People who clean bedpans for seven fifty an hour, she'd like them to see earn nine fifty an hour and have a couple of benefits and be able to feed their children. What an outrage in our society. She's the thug that the right-wing corporate media funds. And remember, they spend billions to brainwash Americans. They believe that the tax cuts did not go to people like me, that they went to the middle class. They did not. The bottom 80% got less money than the top 1% got. They could have doubled the tax cuts for everybody earning under $80,000. Now, you can't even say the word tax shift in the United States. It's obscene because, quote, we create jobs because we have low taxes. Let me give them a clue in economics. We create jobs because there's a demand. The companies are not sitting on $2 trillion of cash right now because they're uncertain about the future. They're sitting on it because the middle class is starving and has no money to spend. We have an economy that's 70% consumer spending. How does capitalism survive when there are pigs at the trough at the top? It can't. So I'd like to end with that. I'd like to thank Jay Smith especially, the organizer. this together and John Wepper of the Brunswick Democratic Club, they did a great job to put this all together and just keep in touch. It, this is a battle that matters to everyone. It matters about families. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming out today. This is such an important issue and um, uh, we're going to wrap up left. now because um, I know a lot of people are left. cold. You, um, this is wonderful. You did this. But we do have so a band much. that's going to do They're some entertainment so if you want to stick around. And I encourage everyone also uh, to go to the sides of the square. We're getting a lot of honking. So if you want to get out there and um, enjoy it, thank you. We'll leave it on just for thank a minute. You all yeah. Thank very you much. so much. It was great to be here. the crowd real fast. I want to thank you. When the governor talks to God on the conversations brew for long, does he ask to take our teachers' rights and let their pensions dry up and die? Does God suggest one Senate Bill 5 when the president talks to God? Excuse me, governor. My bad. When the governor talks to God and the continents are hard and soft. Is he resolute or down the line? Is every issue black or white? Just what God say ever change his mind when the governor talks to God?
Mike, how you doing? Would you be the I one? I find it interesting that you know, you as a well-respected.